picture and the first uh, panel this afternoon focused on peace, uh, on, on, on the idea of peace, mir, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of problematic legacy to be examined, whereas this panel focuses on friendship. So mir and, and drużba being the two kind of operative words here. Uh, and um, certainly friendship, uh, the ideology of friendship is employed very, uh, very often and very heavily uh, in Soviet international kind of geopolitics, uh, Soviet geopolitics of domination. And this ideology of Druzhba continues to be used uh, and abused and employed uh, today by the Russian war machine um, in Ukraine and elsewhere. So the question is, the, the, the questions that we want to answer with this panel are, refer to this idea of friendship. Is friendship dead? Do we, do we have to abandon this idea of friendship and replace it with something else? Or, uh, or is there still something to be, uh, to be taken from it? So uh, I'll introduce, uh, well, I'll introduce the, the, the bios of each speaker uh, when, when they speak. But we have with us um, Ed Fulford, Paulina Baitsim, and Dachyun Tjong. And uh, Tina, Tina Tin Gurgenize uh, is first to speak, the co founder of the Tbilisi Architecture and Pioneer. So I'm the first one. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I will just uh, sit and present like this. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction uh, to the panel and. Um, um, also introducing the panelists. Um, I will be really, really short. Um, I would really just like to uh, make some input uh, um, and just show very like three images of uh, friendship monuments in Georgia to open up the topic uh, and the panel. Um, and I just want to mention also like uh, how we started uh, working on this joint uh, panel which consists of uh, two sections. First section uh, that was before and now the last one. So me, um, Michal and Elena uh, have uh, kind of co-curated and created uh, this uh, discussion. Um, for me personally, I'm uh, also um, uh, kind of following you and saying like from my individual uh, perspective and how I um, was influenced like all my research, my profession, my work, um, and uh, yeah, how it has Basically, since then, uh, 
Russian Empire started uh, like we kind of uh, influencing and uh, Georgia ceased to exist as an independent uh, entity. And so um, and this is like one of the monuments that uh, still exists and uh, maybe you can show another uh, image as well, Elena? Elena? <laughs> yeah, it also like uh, shows a very beautiful uh, scenery from there and uh, it's, uh, the mosaic is also very, very beautiful, showing some uh, images of uh, fairy tales from Georgia and Russia side. Um, and uh, another monument uh, that I want to show um, is uh, a monument that, can you go to another? And this is uh, a monument that uh, was also built in 1983. Uh, and a sculptor of this monument is uh, Zurab Zaratelli that was also mentioned today several times. And many people know also this uh, Russian Georgian sculpture, sculpture who has uh, erected a lot of sculptures and monuments in Soviet Union and also afterwards. Um, and uh, this uh, so called uh, Shashnik, uh, and uh, yeah, it's really like this. Um, uh, it's a column of language uh, which had to also mark this uh, friendship that can never be gone apart, Russia and Georgia. And uh, this picture is in Moscow, and uh, one, uh, the other part, like the other uh, monument, was uh, located in Georgia, um, which was destroyed by the first president of Georgia in 1991, actually, uh, by Zviad um, uh, so this is the remaining one in Georgia. We don't have it anymore. So I think I would like to stop here to open uh, this uh, topic, and uh, I'm uh, really happy to discuss about it after the presentations. So thank you so much. Um, I was uh, struck just now. Like, it's extraordinary when you mentioned the Georgia Treaty and the fact that we have the Russian Georgia. Friendship monuments are built to commemorate the incorporation of Russia, of Georgia into Russia, the imperial incorporation of uh, Georgia into Russia. But the same, I suppose, is true of the Russian Ukrainian friendship monuments, which are built to commemorate the anniversary of the PS, the PS uh, Treaty, which saw the, 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 the signing of the agreement between uh, the Cossack Hetmanet and the Tsarist uh, uh, Russia. And I was struck uh, this previous week uh, on a trip to Bishkek to see uh, the um, Kyrgyz Russian friendship monuments which were um, erected on the centenary of the, as, as, as they say on, the, on their legends, voluntary incorporation uh, of Kyrgyz into, into, um, into the Russian Empire. Of course, this was especially, uh, clearly so in the case of Kyrgyz this was not a voluntary incorporation, this was a violent Imperial conquest, but the, the, the continuities uh, between uh, Soviet Empire and uh, and Tsarist Empire, uh, the, the Tsarist expansion by conquest, are particularly um, plain to see in, in the context of these of these ancient borders um, in Central Asia. Uh, so this uh, this very short talk um, looks at amputate, amputations, dismemberments, and mutations um, of uh, post-Soviet ideologies and aesthetics of uh, friendship. Um, I, I, I focus on two case studies. The start was the Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw from 1955 and Alina Zaposnikov's monument to Polish Soviet friendship, which stood in the building until it was dismembered and discarded in 1992. Uh, and I also mentioned briefly the recently dismantled monument to Russian and Ukrainian friendship in Kiev. Uh, and I ask, um, intend to pose the questions what is to be done with these practices, ideologies, and aesthetics of friendship and adjacent ones of fraternity inherited from the Soviet past? Can the geopolitics of friendship be de Russified and decolonized 
all kinds of decapitations and other, or other kinds of amputations or removals need to be engineered in order to create an anti-fascist form of friendship for a post-Russian future. Um, and the urgency of, of this topic, and I suppose the importance of talking about uh, problematizing this idea of friendship and associated ideas of fraternity was, was highlighted on the more so uh, yesterday or the day before um, with the Nobel uh, Prize Committee's announcement of the joint Nobel Prize for Peace Prize, which was awarded to the Great Center of Civil Liberties, together with Memorial and um, uh, the Russian uh, Human Rights Act, uh, President Human Rights Activist, and extraordinary enough in their uh, uh, all of all of whom were very deserving of the award, but extraordinary enough in their uh, joint announcement of this uh, of this joint prize, the, the Nobel Prize Committee themselves spoke to, uh, spoke in, in languages of uh, of fraternity between nations. Um, so they kind of cos cosplaying uh, Soviet ideals in the announcement of the, um, of the of the Nobel Prize to the representatives of these three uh, post Soviet so, um, the monument to Polish-Soviet friendship by sculptor Alina Zhapotnikov, a Polish sculptor Alina Zhapotnikov, used to stand in the entrance hall of the Palace of Culture, a stand of skyscraper uh, gifted by the USSR to Warsaw in 1955. There it is in situ. Uh, Zhapotnikov's monument, completed in 1955, um, that's the Palace of Culture, um, Zhapotnikov's um, Monument is a sensuously tinged um, socialist realist sculpture of a Polish and Soviet worker locked in an embrace. Shaposnikov's um, own uh, ideology, her own friendship for the Soviet Union, the, the warmth she felt for Russia and the Soviet Union, um, and for Polish peasants and workers, was genuine and heartfelt. Uh, this is despite the fact that in her later work, which is much better known internationally. This was her work that she made after she left Poland for France in the, 19, in the late 1950s. Um, this, uh, this work was determined by her own experience of grave illness, bodily suffering, and disintegration, tuberculosis, bone, and breast cancer. Was far removed in terms of style and feeling from her from her previous work. Um, returning to the socialist realist work uh, from the from the start of this period, however, Shapovalov acknowledged the extent to which her geopolitical and ideological position was influenced by her Jewishness and by her experience of the Holocaust. Shaposhnikov's extensive correspondence with her longtime partner, uh, Ryszard Stanislavski, uh, who was an aristocrat, and despite, or perhaps because of his ideological reservations towards communism, uh, became a grand figure in the Polish communist art world. Uh, it was recently published by the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw, and uh, amidst all of these letters, the only strong statements on politics and the sole mention of the Holocaust are delivered uh, together. So this, these are letters sent between Alina Shankoshnikov and uh, Stanislavski from the early 1950s, and here Stanislavski uh, requests uh, Anush Alina to please uh, don't get too carried away by senseless enthusiasm that beats out from you from your letters as you speak of the new world. And social transformation. So he basically asks to encourage us to, 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 to calm down and to stop being so sensitive and, to start, and, and political. Uh, and she responds that the, the, she responds to him that the difference between her and him lies in the fact that during um, during your formative years, over the last ten years, you did not go through that baptism of despair. Um, all of that, um, all of that, all of that did not vanish. All of those times without a trace. Has happened for me in the ghettos and the camps. Um, so she emphasizes that instead of nice, cultured, and polite, she, she's left only with feelings that are, uh, feelings, um, that are lovely, human, true, and heartfelt. So she emphasizes that her experience of, of suffering, her experience of the Holocaust, um, uh, uh, in a way, determined her politics and determined her. Following the fall of the Polish People's Republic in 1989, 
which unfortunately got sculpture and was sold for the price of scrap metal in 1992. Its arms were hacked off in order to fit it through the palace's narrow doors, and no one could even be bothered to carry it to the goods engines at the rear of the building. This sculpture notoriously stood on the farm near Warsaw for decades, and several attempts to retrieve it uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s being unsuccessful. Uh, failed attempts were also made to convince various Turkish arts institutions to purchase the sculpture uh, in the late 90s. And by the time the institution wanted it, uh, because in the 90s and early 2000s everyone dismissed it as just a kind of piece of Stalinist trash. Um, and by the time by the time they wanted it, the owners realised its value and, uh, and would not let it go. They wouldn't return it. They denied having it. Um, and whereas the empty plinth left behind by the French monument continued to stand in the hall uh, until circa 2015 and occasionally served as the stage for these kinds of uh, uh, photo opportunities, uh, reenactments of socialist friendship. You can see these ladies here even wearing red ribbons, kind of console style pioneer ribbons. Um, but eventually the plinth itself was also removed from the hall um, uh, about seven years ago. Um, the armless sculpture was eventually put on auction and acquired by an anonymous buyer in 2019 for a seven-figure sum, about two million zlotys, so circa 600,000 US dollars. Uh, and the buyer subsequently donated it to the Museum of Modern Art uh, in Warsaw to form part of its collection. Uh, the sculpture is currently destined for the lobby of the museum. This is a, a photograph of a model of the sculpture standing inside the market of the, of the building. Um, the, um, for the lobby of the museum, which is to stand on Parade Square itself, immediately uh, adjacent to the Palace of Culture. So in the lobby, so, so the, 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 the sculpture comes back, so it returns almost to its original um, site. In the lobby of the new museum building, then, the cycle of expropriation and appropriation, mirroring the relationship between the Palace of Culture and the volatile shifting uh, land property regimes of post war and post socialist Warsaw comes full circle, mediated by philanthropy. The sculpture returns almost but not quite home. The museum lobby mimics and taunts the palace lobby opposite, and the sculpture remains amputated. Um, this process of uh, uh, shedding, uh, removal, um, uh, eviction, return, is one of the uh, core components of, of the name of the, of, the, of the book that I'm currently editing for the Museum of Modern Art's new building, uh, which is titled After the Battle, an Amputated Form of, of Friendship Returns. But um, the future of this idea, we're always supposed to finish the book in the next few months, um, but we were rather uncertain as to whether, whether we would keep this uh, name, because the, the, the future of the very idea to install Shabotka's friendship in the museum lobby became uncertain following the uh, full scale Russian invasion of Ukraine um, in February this year. Uh, is it still possible uh, or appropriate for this kind of traumatophilic gesture, in the words of the late Polish art historian Piotr Petrovsky, to be carried out and in fact to constitute the very core of the institutional ideology of a major new museum? The, the trauma uh, of, um, of, of the Stalinist past um, and, and its various um, uh, excesses was already powerfully enough felt in Poland before 2022. And today, in the light of the slaughter in Ukraine, in a city co populated by tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of Ukrainian migrants, many of whose bodies and sensibilities have been scarred and dismembered by a war fought in the name of quasi-Soviet internationalism, a war fought in the name of friendship. Uh, the level of this trauma and, and the level of the failure necessary to overcome or to appropriate it is, is necessarily intensified, increased, uh, and unquantified a number of times. Nevertheless, uh, the, the curator recently confirmed uh, to me that friendship will end up in the, in the lobby after all, uh, standing in the shadow of Ukrainian artist Nikita, Nikita Kadan's rusted flag, which was also um, acquired by the museum in 2019. So this 
fly by, by the Kitana Dani will perform a kind of function here of overshadowing or some other appropriating um, uh, the sculpture. Uh, the fate of Shaposnikov's statue is mirrored, although in an accelerated and distinct form, in Kiev's uh, friendship arch. Unveiled in 1982, uh, an extraordinary example of late modernist abstract monumental public art in developing a multi part neo socialist realist sculptural composition. Um, and this sculptural part, dominated by the monument to Russian and Ukrainian friendship, was removed in April 2022. Um, commenting on the removal, uh, Vladimir uh, Klipstra, the brother of Kyiv's mayor Vidal, referring to the language of brotherly nation, which many Russians insist, insist still, and I still have conversations with Russian friends who, 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 who insist on talking about Bratskina and the brotherly nation when they're, when they're referring to, um, to, to that position on, on the war in Ukraine. Um, wrote, you don't kill your brother, you don't rape your sister. Um, Acts, there are many differences between the two uh, friendship monuments, the one in Warsaw and the one in Kiev. In Warsaw, one worker is Polish and the other is an amorphous, nationally non-specific Soviet figure. In Kiev, one worker is Ukrainian, the other worker is Russian, not even Soviet. Uh, and accidental amputations occurred during both acts of iconoclasm. In Poland, the arms were removed for practical purposes, whereas the head of the Russian um, worker as they were as, they were living, uh, as his um, uh, as the statue was being demanded and just kind of lay there uh, for a while. So uh, instead of a conclusion <coughs> instead of a conclusion I, I'll end up by showing one more image um, of a kind of really disturbing and impressive artwork um, made for a, well, if you can call it that, made for a 2018 exhibition at the Moscow Museum of Architecture, Message of the Day, by Tatiana Paskovskaya and Vance Nina, both of names are pseudonyms. This work is a, a digitally reprinted watercolor painting. It represents Moscow's Zaryadia Park, an American designed Kremlin abutting landscape park and multimedia attraction opened in 2017 by Vladimir Putin on the site of the demolished 1960s Hotel La Silla. Uh, it mocks the, 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 this work, mocks the neo-socialist realist computer renderings of Zadiatia, produced by its American architects, uh, Dennis Gifflio and Renfrey, the, the architects of, of the Highland, um, uh, and the publicity photographs of gratefully franking heteronormative white families circulated by the Moscow Mayor Mayorities PR team. In Laskovskaya and Gnida's vision, the skylights of Zaryatia's uh, media center pavilion, whose undulating roof co-constitutes the park's surface, morph into missile silos. The phallic rockets which protrude from them are marked with familiar propaganda slogans: Zamir for peace and Zabrujan for friendship. These slogans redolent not only of the name of Zaryatia Park, but also the Soviet era of militarized pacifism and Russo-centric internationalism have also been repeatedly invoked by Russia's propaganda war machines since the invasion, and it's spoken as well as written form that their resonance is, is disturbingly amplified by their foregrounding of the letter Z, even though in this case it's the, this work being from 2018, it's still the Cyrillic Z rather than the, rather than the Latin Z. So, um, what then do ideologies of Soviet brotherhood, fraternity, and friendship mean today? Um, how do they compare to ideas of friendship and kinship embedded in other political constellations, whether state socialist, liberal capitalist, or non-Euro-American ones? Do these ideas have any progressive uh, radical potential today, or must we condemn them to our fantastic deaths? Um, what could be the future shapes and aesthetics of friendship, fraternity, sisterhood, and other forms of kinship, or other forms of say, politicized kinship, this, uh, following the inevitable disintegration of the post Soviet fascist, hyper patriarchal, white supremacist Russian Empire and its numerous fellow travelers and enablers? So, without answering any of these questions myself, I'll leave that task to the remaining um, members of the panel. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and um, and I, I think we'll move on in the order that the uh, program is printed. So starting with Ed Pulford, um, who is an anthropologist and lecturer in Chinese studies at the University of Manchester.
got to do before introducing Ed. So uh, Ed's an anthropologist and lecturer in Chinese studies at Manchester University. His first book, Mirrorlands, explores Russian-Chinese connections across time through countries' shared borders. And he has written for academic and popular publications on socialist friendship among other topics. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, both Trinity's and uh, Nicole's presentations have come first because they have uh, established the architectural relevance of this idea. Uh, I'm not primarily or even secondarily, I think, a anthropologist of architecture, so uh, I'll be talking more conceptually about friendship, um, and especially from a context where these terms, uh, peace, friendship, and indeed the third totem there, the pro progress of that myth, uh, all of these are, I think, even more alive in the context I'm going to be discussing than they are in a post Soviet space, um, that being China. So, Dружба, uh, Yogi in Chinese, friendship, uh, near peace, Turkey in Chinese, and progress or progress, uh, in Chinese, all of them are totems of uh, kind of cross border relationships uh, with, involving China. So, I'm going to be discussing. Uh, drawn on field work, this is uh, just a general guide of where I'm talking about. Uh, I've conducted uh, long term research over several years in a, the town at the very centre of this map, Kunshun, which uh, is in a Korean autonomous part of northeast China uh, and lies directly on the border of Russia. That's the southernmost part of uh, Yumorsky Krai, uh, down uh, south of southwest of Vladivostok. And the town also lies directly on the uh, border with North Korea, although I'll talk a bit less about that, I'll mention this to you. So, as a location on the border, uh, Hunchun is a site of everyday encounter between uh, Russian, Chinese, and Korean people. Uh, many of the local businesses, many of the local population have opened uh, businesses catering for Russians crossing the border, of course, in a pre pandemic era. Um, and uh, sell all manner of everyday household goods and other things to Russian uh, clients, Russian uh, vendors, uh, sorry, Russian uh, clients and customers. Uh, so that includes, you know, um, household things like blinds or, or curtains, it includes, um, uh, you know, beauty products and, and makeovers and things. Lots of Russians also come to this town for hospital treatment, which is uh, much cheaper and more available than it is uh, in southern Primoria. And you can see the use of uh, certain uh, icons of the age uh, to advertise low prices, lowest prices in the Um There are actually a lot of local Russians who are quite offended by that picture uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, but in any case, this is the brief context for the town itself. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it lies at the exact point where these three variously post socialist or still socialist or partially socialist countries meet together. Uh, the uh, kind of spit of land that runs down the southeast of the town ends at the point where you can climb a little tower and look out over the three countries, the official slogan of this place, Fang Chuan, uh, Fang Chuan is uh, three countries at a single glance. Uh, so you're standing there directly at this triple border point. But uh, in terms of the sorts of things that occur in this town that are relevant to our theme today, well, as a site of constant encounters between all three of these countries, um, it is a constant locus for friendship events of all sorts. So, uh, under slogans like Kun Chun is blossoming, uh, strengthening or deepening friendship between China and Russia, or uh, evenings of friendship, uh, which in that case, curiously, the quote on the right involves. South Korea, it's interesting, it's again, it's, a, it's an aside, but the way that South Korea is sort of marshaled into languages and dynamics of friendship, uh, as though to replace North Korea, which even Russia and China have a hard job to deal with, uh, is a, one interesting dimension of this. But this is basically a, an everyday environment where friendship is mobilized and spoken about a great deal and encouraged as a mode of everyday interaction among people from uh, this particular um, and indeed, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, an extensive everyday interaction, as I say, among people, uh, regular people from these countries, and everyone in this part of China, or indeed Russia, or South North Korea, are marginal from the center of any of their respective uh, imperial 
of state sentiments. So there's a kind of uh, natural, I guess, what anthropologists, sociologists might see as a natural environment where everyday forms of friendship might emerge. However, at the very top level, friendship is, of course, the dynamic promoted at these, uh, between these states, and that explains a lot of why it's there. And as I say, I think the Chinese sort of friendship industrial complex uh, is altogether more uh, sophisticated or more uh, kind of categorical about friendship even than uh, some a lot of the post-Soviet space. So this is a ceremony in 2018, uh, which Xi Jinping uh, awarded Vladimir Putin the uh, Chinese Friendship Medal, PRC's highest international honor. And uh, during his speech, uh, Xi Jinping declared at this, uh, this ceremony that President Putin is his, is his most intimate friend. Um, a term in Chinese, Zhuxi Kongyo, which means uh, someone who knows your heart, someone who is so deeply uh, embedded with you in a relationship that uh, um, you know, it's uh, familiar. There's a lot to be said about this, but I think I'm trying to open as many topics as I am uh, to conclude here. Friendship operates as a Chinese mode of international engagement or a, a, a kind of available relationship at the Chinese state level uh, across a much wider sweep of locations and interactions than just Russia though. So uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, uh, I think something that many people will be familiar with as China's flagship uh, international engagement strategy, the New Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road, um, is closed in the language of friendship. So uh, the Belt, uh, the, the uh, Economic Belt part across Central Asia to Europe uh, was launched uh, in a speech in 2013 at Nazarbayev University Stunned by Xi Jinping, uh, and the speech was titled Celebrating Friendship Between Peoples and Creating Together a Common Future. Uh, similarly, the maritime part of the Belt and Road Initiative, launched in Indonesia the same, uh, the same year, um, was uh, carried out as a, on, up with a, an exhibition on the sidelines with a, um, a photo show of the history of Sino Indonesian friendship. Uh, so, this was a speech that uh, with friendships also and um, guiding the, uh, the overall dynamics of the relationship. <coughs> However, in the Sino-Russian case, the, the friendship goes uh, a, little, a little deeper, so uh, we can look into the history of this tie, I think, to figure out what kind of a relationship interstate friendship is supposed to be, uh, both during and since socialism. So the formal relationship between China and Russia today is defined by a 2001 treaty, signed by uh, someone you already know who that is, and Jan Vermin, the predecessor but one of Xi Jinping. Uh, this is a treaty uh, officially called a sino russian Treaty of Good Neighbourliness, Friendship and Cooperation, um, and was a sort of renewal of a uh, kind of uh, you know, dynamic that I'll come on to uh, briefly in a second. But uh, you can see, again, certain, I guess, totems, certain language symbolism of Relations that have already been discussed, uh, especially cooperation, cooperation and friendship, being primarily these uh, sort of relations that define yes, um, interstate relations uh, at this stage. Friendship between China and Russia has been celebrated uh, in very recent times, uh, including amidst the sort of uh, changing relations of the pandemic era, of wartime, and so on. So in 2020, a delivery of uh, medical supplies and PPE and protective clothing that doctors and other people dealing with COVID-19 uh, cases have to wear, uh, was defined uh, in People's Day, the official common Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece, as proof of the relationship, of the friendship between the two peoples uh, of China and Russia. Similarly, uh, and very recently, and indeed, as I think many people are probably also aware, only days before, two, two three weeks before the uh, full bloody invasion of Ukraine, China and Russia signed a communique during Putin's attendance at the uh, opening of the Winter Olympics, which defined the relationship in even stronger terms as a Russian or a borderless friendship without borders, without boundaries. Um, so there's a lot of focus on this friendship without boundaries, what it means, what it's meant in the context of the war and so on. Um, again, that's another topic to explore. There's a lot of fixation on this friendship. There's a lot of stuff in that communicate, but I won't go into so much detail about it now. But 
But the whole kind of uh, atmosphere, of course, around this China-Russian relationship has a very obvious precursor, one which I think is probably, again, very familiar to any number of people with uh, even a cursory knowledge of the Soviet past, and in particular, the uh, mid-20th century relationship between the Soviet Union and China. So this language of friendship was, was uh, reached its sort of high, uh, its, its zenith, its apogee, uh, during the 1950s, um, following the signing of a treaty of friendship with uh, language very similar to that uh, more recent 2001 treaty, which was signed by uh, Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong. Uh, so this was celebrated in all kinds of ways, most uh, of and uh, kind of, uh, uh, editorials in the Xinhua, Xinhua Daily newspaper, and uh, all kinds of, uh, so I guess, uh, the diagnoses that this new relationship will produce within China, maps, for example, that uh, totted up the relative strength in militaries and, and satellites and other things of the socialist world uh, versus the non-socialist world. <coughs> that was also, of course, celebrated by, in an often highly masculinist form. Uh, indeed, one that also posited the Soviet advisor as a sort of superior, civilized partner to a developing China uh, that was reliant on the uh, Soviet example, but also uh, parity, you know, was perhaps more of a feature of certain other representations, whether that was in uh, visual form or indeed a number of songs, uh, for example, uh, the Sino-Soviet friendship song, Moscow, Beijing, uh, I guess, uh, time, as well as uh, other friendship celebrating songs uh, promoted amongst youth groups all of the Chinese equivalent the uh, uh, So these kind of um, you know uh, cultural everyday expressions of friendship representations were very popular. However, this has a still further back, so I'm now sort of archaeologizing a bit this, this relationship. This has a, another precursor to that because this language of friendship, the representation of friendship, and again this has already been mentioned and suggested that by friendship between peoples was a, a pre-existing Soviet framework for understanding the relations between uh, uh, domestic nationalistic, right, the national, national groups of the Soviet Union. It was uh, a relationship celebrated in the national anthem of the Soviet Union, particularly this line, Ruth de la Rosa of the Ocean of Hot, the second line of the second stanza, the solid bulwark uh, or guarantee of of people's friendship. Incidentally, uh, I was reminded during Armina's uh, talk during the earlier period of this national anthem because uh, in this case it was Strauss, this uh, architect rebuilding uh, the, his own building after the destruction of post-war. Well, the same person who wrote the Soviet national anthem, uh, its first incarnation, its post-1977, no, 1972 incarnation, and its post-Soviet Russian incarnation, the same person, and Ruth Benarodov appeared in the Stalin era of the National Anthem and the 1970s one, and has been re uh, replaced by Bratsky and Narodi uh, in the post 2000s uh, or post 90s Russian National Anthem. Uh, but in any case, uh, that is brotherly peace. So it was this friendship among Soviet peoples that was mapped out onto the international scale among socialist countries, China. Case I've highlighted here, but of course also any number of other states, uh, including uh, Cuba here. Now, uh, I guess a few final things to say and why research in Hun Chun and what my kind of uh, interest in both the everyday level relationship and the uh, kind of state level relationship is revealed. This is essentially, uh, as far as I have come to understand it, a relationship founded on difference, founded on a fundamental structure of otherness which in many ways is represented by the classification, the taxonomies of peoples, the national identification project that was so key to the early Soviet uh, kind of mission to emotionally <laughs> liberate uh, the, the former, this Churman uh, Arod, as Lenin called it, the prison of peoples that was the former Tsarist Empire. So classifying peoples and each having then a defined uh, identity, a cultural repertoire, and then defining the relations among them as friendship was uh, a kind of entangled process that makes 
cultural essentialism really key to the idea of friendship and makes boundaries of reified difference central to this dynamic. This works in interesting ways in Russia because people from the Russian and the Chinese side of the border still look on one another in quite essentialized terms despite interacting every, at an everyday level. So tour companies advertising tours from that part of Russia into China represent Hunshu as this kind of fairyland, exotic, oriental space, despite the fact that Primordia, the part of Russia that people come to China from, is further east than the whole of China. Uh, it's still this sort of eastern Asian country. But equally, going the other way, Chinese tourists visiting uh, Russia, Vladivostok and other more smaller locations in this region, are advertised to in this kind of Disney-fied uh, version of lots of locations that are thousands of miles away from Vladivostok. So the historical museum in Moscow, or the uh, Church on Blood, or the St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg, the comes to the up at the top. These kind of locations are used to advertise trips to Russia, which are just like going 50 kilometers down the road. So this kind of essentialist vision, uh, I guess, it defines the relationship, these kind of static categories of uh, otherness, um, but there's more to be said about all these things. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm afraid that's pretty well timed. Uh, there's a lot more to be said about the channel. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people like to go to. Yeah. I don't want to expect to be able to whenever I agree with this. Right. Um, so, uh, thanks very much, Ed. And um, now we move on to Matthew Chong, uh, an adjunct professor at New York University, where he's just completed his PhD thesis. Um, with the title of Soviet Architectural Postmodernism, 1977 to 1991, uh, under Professor Jean Louis Cohen's supervision. Uh, that also worked at Roma, New York, uh, where he had the Maryland Mar Mar Museum Research Consortium Fellowship. Um, so, that will all go over to you. Well, thank you, Michal, for that introduction, and thank you, Tim Tim, for having me here. So, it's a great honor to be here with such inspiring people in this lovely city. It's my second time here. I think I like it more this time around. <laughs> and um, so my presentation, it's, uh, it's really a prolongation of the investigation begun by Ed, in the sense that, so I'll present reflections on you know, something quite similar, so the architectural relationship between the Soviet Union and the rest of Asia, so not China, but the rest of the world, particularly Cambodia and North Korea, as well as with Africa, well, two countries, um, Guinea and um, Egypt. So it's a very uh, brief uh, presentation that's based on an academic article that I'm writing at the moment. So <clears throat> my presentation is it's going to be about what I tentatively call it Soviet architectural Afro Asianism. So this concept of Afro Asianism. Um, the genesis of which I'll uh, discuss shortly, it helps me understand the particularity of Soviet architectural view to the post colonial world. Uh, that is, the way in which Soviet built structures in Asia and Africa very much resemble one another, formally and typologically, and how this reveals a single methodology applied to two different, to very different contexts. So, in Mark Fathers, I'll argue that if the Soviets wanted the buildings that they were building in Africa and Asia to look similar to one another and to serve similar functions, um, this was very intentional. This was because they allowed the emergent Afro Asian discourse to exert influence on them. And this is also because they sought to bring Asia and very consciously sought to bring Asia and Africa closer together than ever before. So in short, the purpose, uh, their intention, the, the, the intention of the Soviet builders was to, to forge friendships among newly independent African and Asian nations. And, but I must point out that at the same time, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, one of the beneficiaries of Soviet architectural aid in 1979, the world was made aware of how easily friendship could turn into animosity and how readily fraternal aid could become a basis for imperialism. 
So I'll begin with this uh, particularly telling comparison. So on the one hand, we have um, Conakry Polytechnic Institute. In Conakry, Guinea, which is a country in West Africa, um, that was liberated by French colonial. This uh, Polytechnic Institute was completed in 1962. On the other hand, we have Cabo um, Polytechnic Institute in Cabo, Afghanistan, which was completed in 1963. So in a contemporary text that was published by this very interesting entity called the Soviet Africa Institute, Institute Africa. Concrete Polytechnic Institute is described as the first higher education establishment in the country that was to help it, quote, solve the urgent problem of the training of technical personnel, end quote. While this building was going up, the Soviets also established EE's first radio station, undertook geological surveys in search of gold and diamonds, and reconstructed the aerodrome. The development assistance that the Soviet Union extended to Guinea, which was begun in 1959, was part of a larger initiative that, in the words of the historian Alessandro Landolo, quote, rapidly and radically modernizing West African societies to make them a concrete example of the advantages of socialist development. The main drive of Soviet policy was the ideological conviction that the kind of modernization that the USSR could offer to Guinea was superior to anything that the West could propose. So as for Cabo Polytechnic Institute, it was built along with 50 four-story large panel apartment buildings to be distributed over two microrayon. That's a very typical Soviet urban planning unit, right? And the university was to serve, the institute was to serve as a node in the new residential district. The architect of Cabo Polytechnic Institute, P.G. Steve Yushin, was associated with um, key provos, Gasudarisu Institute of Dirabanyu Bushya Bucho Pizanitinye, or the State Institute for the Design of Higher Education Establishments, which was based in Moscow and oversaw the construction of higher education establishments, university buildings, throughout the Soviet Union, as well as abroad. For instance, in, in addition to Afghanistan, Burma, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Mali, and Mongolia. So at both sides, an intricate mosaic panel meaningfully offsets the stern modernism of the architecture. In Conakry, we see a figure seemingly in flight one whose dynamism is heightened by the strident colors chosen by the artist, while in Cabo, we have a collage of symbols representing the different scientific disciplines taught at the Institute. The writing in the center reads, knowledge is light. Here, I would like to propose that the striking analogy between the two buildings forms a basis on which to speak of what might be called Soviet architectural anthro to argue that the Soviet Union, in extending architectural aid to post-colonial states in Africa and Asia, strategically embraced the emergent notion of the unity of the two continents. Ah, okay. Was that your answer? No, that goes further. Further. Ah, okay. Okay. Is this better? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. It's just that I'm not fine. So the, it's the Algerian philosopher Malad Ben Ali who was the first to use the term Afro-Asiatism in his book Afro-Asiatism Conclusions of the Bandung Conference, L'Afro-Asiatisme Conclusions sur la Conférence de Bandung, published just one year after said conference. Ben Ali insisted that the peoples of Africa and Asia were faced with the same task, that of, quote, elevating the underdeveloped man to the level of civilization, which is a social level, and elevating the civilized man to the level of humanity, which is a moral level, end quote. Nine years after Benami's book appeared, it's Pierre Gay, a French diplomat, who attempted a history of Afro-Asiatism. 
The importance of Kay's history of Afro Asian discipline to Bandung, is brought enough by the teaching she's get on home, resides in its mention of the role of the Soviet Union in the consolidation of Afro Asian discipline, which is why it's placed at the center of my um, research on this phenomenon of um, Soviet architecture of Afro Asian discipline. Because Kay makes it very explicit, you know, the role that the Soviet Union played in the, in the propagation of this idea and in the, in the development of this idea. So Kay point, pointed out in this book, where he attempts the history of Afro-Asianism, that a shared pursuit of the socialist ideal lay at the heart of Afro-Asianism, which he saw largely as a form of international leftism. So against this backdrop, I would like to propose that Afro-Asianism formed an important but often overlooked aspect of how socialist friendship was understood and practiced that a historical approach foregrounding Afro-Asianism could reveal the Soviet Union to have been at the receiving end of a discursive exchange, to have subscribed to and made policy in accordance with Afro-Asianism, which was a discursive product originating in the post-colonial world. So it's an idea that originated in the post-colonial world and the Soviet Union, so usually you think of the Soviet Union, you know, uh, exporting discursive products to, to the post-colonial world. But in this case, I'm trying to demonstrate that uh, the opposite happened, in the sense that the Soviet Union really sort of um, uh, fixated on the idea of Afro-Asianism, which it did not invent, which was invented by um, these post-colonial nations. And, and how um, the examples that I'm showing you today are representative of, the, of, of this dynamic. So now I would like to bring to your attention two buildings serving distinct primary functions. One is a monument, the one you see on the left. The other is a hospital. So they serve distinct primary functions, but they serve an identical auxiliary function, which is that of celebrating the idea of friendship. So one is called, you know, the monument. So it's very explicit. The monument. It's a monument to Soviet Egyptian friendship. The other is a fair Soviet friendship. So, the monument to Soviet Egyptian friendship in Aswan, Egypt, it was inaugurated in 1970 on the occasion of the completion of the Soviet built Aswan Dome, which was the, which it still is the world's largest embankment then. And on the right, we have the Khmer Soviet Friendship Hospital in Phnom Penh, Phnom Penh Cambodia, which was built in 1960. The architect of this hospital his name is N.L. Jakobsen, and he was affiliated with Kipu Zrav, as well as the Institute of Bright Ziravani, Abyekt of Zravahani, which was an entity very similar to Kipu, was that I introduced earlier. So there were, in the Soviet Union, there existed these design institutes that specialized in the construction of, you know, um, on the one hand, higher education facilities, right, in the case of Kipu, and, you know, on the other hand, in the case of hospitals and recreation centers. Um, so two, two entities, two design institutes that were um, that played a very important role in the um, in the exportation of Soviet architecture expertise to the post world. Um, so the monuments like the one in Aswan that you see here on the left, or the the Chaoyuman statue, oh, sorry, that in Pyongyang, North Korea that you see here on the left, which is um, designed by Soviet-trained North Korean um, artists. So monuments of this kind, they're very typical of socialist architecture, right? I mean, Kina Tin has shown us some um, examples. Pinha has shown us examples, right? And after over three decades, since the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, monuments of this kind continue to be built, right? Notably by the North Korean Mansude Art Studio, which is also the authorial collective, right, that, that designed the Chalima statue that you see on the left. And, um, and this uh, North Korean Mansude Art Studio is very interesting. It's a very interesting kind of um, uh, group of artists who are really perpetuating the idea of socialist friendship in the absence of socialism, right? Or the idea of Afro-Asianist friendship in the new era of Afro-Asianism that 
sort of um, excludes the Soviet Union. And um, so it's, it's basically China who has taken over the role of the Soviet Union in, in the region in, in Africa. So, so, that, um, so it's really making its presence felt in, in, in Africa, right? Um, through various development projects and, and very aggressive investment, right? Um, and the, the dynamic composition of the African Ren Renaissance Mo Monument in Dakar, Senegal, which was uh, completed in 2010, it's also the North Korean Man's favorite studio that uh, designed this monument. The, the, the composition of it clearly takes after the composition of the Cholima statue, but here it must be pointed out that the composition of the Cholima statue was based on that of Viera Mujimans, 1937 worker and co host So thank you very much for your attention. Very rich and again, half the time. You do? Okay. So, um, Paulina Whiteson, our, our final speaker, is an art historian and curator specializing in the history of Ukraine and Soviet visual arts. Currently, she's a PhD candidate um, in comparative history at CEU, Central European University, um, and her book, Art for Architecture in Ukraine, Soviet Modern Mosaics from 1960 to 1990, uh, co written with the again.
and also that was predating that of Manon's more or less opera, um, The Great Friendship, um, like a big event for Soviet culture. And particularly this bad band of this opera was um, having substantial implications for the Ukrainian art workers. So basically the story that I'm going to recap is probably familiar to many of us who are here because it contains the elements of the struggle between writers and editors, um, kind of exposing professional dissatisfaction with the text that was eventually published. I guess a lot of experience this has this experience in writing. And um, I'm looking at the Ukrainian entry, like entry of the Ukrainian art in the 55th volume of the Great Soviet Encyclopedia. Also this book probably that was in many houses, and this, this particular volume was issued in 1947. And we know from studies of Brian Castle that this book was very important and it was largely disordered and conceived as socialist book of very high profile. And the entry on Ukrainian art in this book carried unprecedented significance for Ukrainian art workers because it was the first survey-like text on Ukrainian art history at the times when there were no comparable publications and the course of Ukrainian art still was not developed and introduced as a curriculum of art universities. So the art authors of this entry were Yakin Zatnansky and Maurice Kupnik Siversky, um, figures that are unknown in the international scholarship. And I'm rather particularly interested in Zatnansky as he was one to be condemned with this anti patriotic critical campaign. At the first sight of his biography, he seems to be rather an average art bureaucrat having the career read a letter. However, the closer acquaintance with his diaries and memoirs avails very curious trajectory and um, just some details. Uh, for instance, during the Great Purge, he was excluded from the party for concealing his months long conscription in the White Army in 1919, then fired for the from the Kiev State Museum of Russian Art. At that time, he endured continuous unemployment, starvation, and strict deprivation that resulted into Stalin related hallucinations and six months forceful confinement at the Kiev State Psychiatric Hospital. From where it was, he escaped with other nine patients, melted aluminium spool into a big block, and returned as all rather waves following day. During World War II, he evacuated the Central State Museum of the Russian Chapel Collection from Kiev to Kharkiv. And in his wartime memoirs, he recalls numerous attempts to pursue his work of the Russian Chapel and portrays it as an only activity to help him to secure his sanity. In June 1942, he moved to Almaty with his family, where he occupied the director position at the Kazakh State Russian Chapel Art Gallery. And he, there he also gave a series of lectures on Ukrainian art. In 1946, he defended the dissertation of the Russian Chamber as an artist, candidate kind of dissertation, I have to say. And subsequently, he also wrote a book on Kazakhstan art scene in Ukraine and kind of became a specialist who was bridging the, the art scenes of the republics. So, this entry um, he brought on Ukrainian art in the encyclopedia. For contemporary readers, probably what we do that was kind of a difference or a spark of irritation as it commenced with the introduction of the shared origins of Ukrainian, Russian, and other Russian art. The art, namely the art of the East Slavic people that peaked during the Kievan Rus, and not that Ukrainian art became national with the birth of the Ukrainian nation in the 14th century. But by the end of 1947, months after the volume release, this text fueled better results that we just repeat on here and it professional record. On December 17, at the Union of Premises in Kiev on Krishati Street 54, an art expert, Ion Voice Rosenberg, now under his pen name Bernie Vladic, inaugurated the session of the Criticist section, Union section of criticism, with a sharp tongue and section of the entry. His extensive attack on the authors covered incompetence, tendency to distort the facts, and a supreme fallacy in the Russian nationalist stance. 
um, he exposes calls to the audience with a good quotation and narrating at the pages of the repellent phrases and ridiculing the misprints in the artwork titles. For instance, there was an artwork of Volodymyr Vostensky which was called The Interrogation of the Enemy, and with a single letter of spelling it turned into the interrogation of the doctor. I mean, the pros for God, the pros for child. Vladish was not hiding the overtones of personal enmity, was especially furious with that nasty part of the article going as far as stating that the author doesn't know and doesn't love Ukrainian art. Um, at the first meeting, among the two of the defaulters, only Wutnik Sikorsky was present, and he provided a detailed account of the editor's cuts that resulted in the content twist. He insisted that the editors quite, I would say, quite um, convincingly, like, convincingly insisted that the editors of the Encyclopedia in Moscow had chosen irrelevant illustrations and mispresented the art of the whole republic. He kind of he showed his text and the edited text. And, uh, but the session was postponed as the most section members were not familiar with the entry. So then the winter holidays ceased and on January 7, 1948, the discussion of the entry continued and lasted long after midnight. And Vladish presided in his position of the leading assailant, and he would occupy this role through the late forties, evidently under the protectorate of the Union's head, an artist was so this young. I'm putting this for a kind of a context because this anti-patriotic critic campaign is usually in Russian context, for example, is kind of connected to this anti-Jewish campaign, and like in Ukrainian case, it was a bit different. So the co-author of Vladish, Terhi Rayovsky, was also an expert of Tarish Shachanov heritage. He eagerly joined this class with and uh, other art historians um, who were present, Ivan Rana, for example, Halim Chen, other people. They articulated their criticism in general and supported this claim that the anti framework was more traditional. So let's delve into what was what does it mean to have a virtual nationalistic framework? So, art historians' collective assessment relied on several aspects of the text, but foremostly criticized the absence of the class dimension in the historical account and uh, the separation of Ukraine and Russian access, especially in the 19th century part written by Zatnansky. The absence of the class, namely of the class wars, was especially emphasized with the one description of Mikhail Vyachuk and his school. Um, this is a group of artists who was executed during the Kurd Great Purge, but through the history of the Soviet Union up until Karamodova or Perestroika, they were um, they were kind of like art historians were forced to portray them as threatening enemies that were victoriously combated by the Soviet artists. Outrageously, on the other hand, like the other aspect, Zatanaski presented several Russian artists as Ukrainian, and uh, Vladich considered the labeling of creators born in Ukraine and educated in Russia as Ukrainian, as Kandalov's underwater attempt to exclude Russian influence from Ukrainian art history. Of course, the utmost concern was the description of the Russian Chenko activities, who Zatanaski placed as the most important origin of art democratization even before Paris Vizhniki. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the context, for me, it was very important for social surrealism doctrine. Basically, almost anonymously, all art historians decided that Danaski's sub chapter on folk art and creative industry was regarded the most Russian nationalist fragments because Danaski implied that there is an autogenic connection between folk and professional art. Overall, the entry was proclaimed as harmful for upbringing Soviet readers. So, for my final re remarks, I just want you to kind of zoom out a bit and analyze these faults of the larger context of historical scholarship in the Soviet Ukraine, in the Soviet Union. The scholars, um, particularly Sergei Yakovlev, while discussing on the vicissitude of the development of Marxist Leninist history in Ukraine, pointed that by 1947, by the time that I'm talking now. When Lazar Kavanovich arrived in Ukraine to purify Ukrainian textbooks from Russian nationalism, Ukrainian historians learned that the same way to develop their career is to write class history, starting with the shared cradle of the Kievanis, omitting any negative assessment of the Russian Empire colonial policies that in Ukrainian case led to very reduced class history. The friendship campaign in the late 30s 
was connected with the Soviet nationalist policies related to the Constitution, that it signaled the radical shift in the understanding of the nation as having primordial rules, something that you were talking about. And this entry, for instance, relies on the proposal of the Moscow historians, and I think Dushko, to consider the 14th century as the Ukrainian nation dates of first. But the national dimension, construed by many Ukrainian historians, was perceived differently and read differently. And because it overlaps with the word people, narod, it eventually led to bringing up folk art. This understanding of the nation, of the primordial nation, endures through the late 40s and season with World War II kind of pervades the Russian centuries and transgress into understanding of art history, pushing to art experts to produce similarly confusing overviews, prioritizing one way direction of Russian influences. So, interestingly, like how this whole controversy ended, Zabinaski never provided formal feedback to his colleagues on his polls, and during this like, second session he remained mostly silent. However, his personal farm contained a collection of handwritten notes where he reacts to this report, and he names, he kind of calls this bloody report a continuous development, totally opposite to what Bolshevik criticism should be. He was insulted to the bottom of his heart uh, by bloody claim of not loving Soviet Ukrainian art, and uh, he appealed to his titles and letters of the union members, Soviet art expert, and academic degree that he, that he kind of with this uh, um, appellation, kind of trying to argument that like he loves Ukrainian art and a lot of age is actually the one who doesn't love Ukrainian art because he offered to name it like all the art before the revolution, you know, before the 1917 Malorosh. Finally, the undermines their positions as art expert Vladimir Chemerovsky grounded with the idea of good intentions, considered a barrage to artists and artists grant and conflict labor, Bolshevik critics. It's still something that is important to remember, it's like May of Portis, and they still exercise the idea of Bolshevik criticism that Bolshevik critics must pursue. So in the early 50s, after the patriotic campaign, he delivered a speech on the questions of art history, in which he advocated for the accommodation of Stalin works on linguistics, on linguistics into the Marx Leninist method of art history. This speech kind of unveiled his project of Ukrainian art history that he was striving to bring into the focus from the early 30s. Um, so he was trying to to cater to bring the artists who were serfs under the Russian Empire into the focus of art history. And thus he proceeded to undermine the conventional Soviet hierarchy between folk and professional. Well, I, I can say that it is a bit important in the in the 40s, this was the conference, but in the 60s, that Nazi was highly influential as a director of a, of a couple of institutions, I mean, art, art institutions in Ukraine, and basically his kind of perspective on Ukrainian history was very common. But this this particular case for me reveals a lot of processes that were undergo undergoing in the community of professional art, art experts. And uh, they were generally trying to develop this Marxist understanding of our history with accommodation of Lenin and Stalin's works. This is what I believe. And many art historians they were striving to claim art history as science, it's kind of like in this enlightenment way, and operated with the terms like subjectivity and objectivity, different between truly objective Marxist method and bourgeois objectivity, meaning disengagement that was praised by Western art historians. Therefore, subjectivity was in a numerous occasion mostly cast as a strong side of Soviet art expertise. What is what is more, there were competing understanding of what friendship with Russian artists is. I mean, even within what is so called kind of official writing of history, so people who worked in their institutional kind of occupying, converted institutional positions, they were differing with how they should describe friendship with artists, with Russian artists. But there was one that were will be more prioritizing Russian influence, there will be another one that trying to portray the more Ukrainian side, and it's also going to be all happening in the 
remnants of official art history. And um, yeah, and there was like almost always a problem how it should be described as an art historical overuse, because the first faculty of history and art history in Ukraine will be established only in 1959. Yes, and while there were many different alterations, at the core of this was Shevchenko studies and readings of his creative trajectory. And for, for me, actually, this understanding of Shevchenko creative trajectory was many to be understanding of French. So 
I think that this very famous building should be analyzed in a contemporary colonial context. How this, like, because like most of the people talk about this, like, oh, how beautiful it is, and architects were genius and stuff, and like, brutalism in London and brutalism in Georgia. No, it's a symbol of colonialism from the past and from the, uh, the contemporary times as well. Uh, I would like to reflect on one um, um, like a, um, sentence that was made by the presenter. Sorry, I forgot the name. Um, um, uh, this uh, perverted uh, idea of friendship I heard in the presentation. Yeah? So for me, this kind of uh, thinking or uh, wording uh, is also another type of colonization. Because even like, uh, uh, I'd say even Georgian Ukrainian historical cultural national context, yeah, uh, the friendship between real friendship, I'm not talking about like two posh poets living in Kiev and one posh uh, Ukrainian aristocrat living in Tbilisi, uh, developed during Soviet Union, was forged in Soviet Union, that's when the Ukrainians and Georgians got really got to know each other. So that's why you have, for example, in Western Georgia there is one village called Shroma, means a uh, neighbor. You have a massive mosaic of the friendship of a Georgian and a Ukrainian people. Uh, so I think uh, calling an idea, calling a perverted idea of friendship, you can call it an aesthetic, political aesthetic of it, but to call it perverted, it's a, for me it's like, it's an offense to my parents, to my grandparents, who really thought that there was friendship, not because of Soviet, like really between people, especially in the context of living and creating the same economic or social, whatever we like it or not, like they experienced this living together, and this living together was not, uh, like, let's say, uh, uh, maybe the whole idea of Soviet Union was bad, but this relationship between peoples and the feeling of friendship and doing something together or not was not perfect. And it, it is, uh, for me, a liberal, colonial, western wording of describing people's relationship, social relationships in the East uh, Europe or the like, Middle East where we are Caucasia. Uh, so I really wanted to reflect on this. Thank you very much. Years or three years in Soviet Union, but since I was born, I 
here and this like this fake friendship, like every like perverted, like this nothing has ever existed and it was just created by force from Moscow and nothing ever people like and it's like, like sorry like uh, I didn't mean to like uh, critique your I just wanted to express my opinion that uh, uh, this uh, this exact sentence of perverted friendship and uh, fake friendship was introduced by the neoliberal forces in the post-Soviet space to dismantle every idea of solidarity between nations after post-Soviet Union, so they could like do their colonial work here. Okay, I, I understand you completely, and maybe I can exercise my moderating skill to kind of re-reformulate this question because I think what you're talking is very important. As we see, there are so many layers in the idea and this metaphor of friendship, and many of them, as contributors have has been showing, are actually the ideas that like that are excluded war or like any violence acts. Is there still a space for us to use this word? It's like when describing something. I think this is something that Michael was proposing to like to uh, to reflect on to all of us, and yeah, I guess, do we still use friendship for describing solidarity when Putin is intimate friend like, of uh, South Korea leader, right? Yeah, okay, so I guess this is the problem. If there's so many, many, so many layers, is there actual heuristical potent, potency Thank you, thank you for the uh, comment. Maybe there are other uh, questions because I don't want to talk so much. We already talked, so maybe, yes, there is a question. Uh, I have a question which uh, focuses on uh, one object which was mentioned by Michael. Uh, and uh, you know the, the story of the palace of friendship and tech, that symbol of friendship which is palace of science and techniques which was built in by the Soviet Union in Warsaw, the capital of Poland. And I know that you worked with that topic for a long time because we were discussing this topic on Minsk Architecture Forum years ago. And for me, it's a like very important example because Poland is thinking about what to do with the building and how to like recapitalize uh, the concept of friendship and that it was like a gift, you know, uh, and how to reconceptualize the gift Soviet Union, so maybe some views and some new approaches. What's going on with the building? Um, thanks for the question. I mean, the, um, the question of the relationship between the gift and the idea of friendship is also interesting because I think in the Soviet discourse, uh, the gift is presented as an act of friendship that capitalism has commodities and commodities are evil and they're about exploitation and about uh, inequality and extraction. Whereas socialism has gifts, and gifts are just about creating solidarity and friendship and other kinds of altruistic or disinterested bonds between uh, between people. Um, so the, the, uh, and there are many documents from the from the time of the uh, construction of the palace which really emphasise this kind of extraordinary novelty of of a, it, 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 um, of a supposedly completely disinterested gift from one nation to another, for which. Uh, the receiving nation doesn't have to give back anything, and that this is a completely new chapter in international relations, and it's amazing, and it shows just how peaceful and how friendly and how solidarity forming uh, Soviet uh, socialism is. So the, the gift and friendship are two definitely um, connected ideas, and it's also interesting that still in, uh, of course, today, I suppose this refers to what you were saying too, that in the Soviet Union and in state socialist countries, and as well as in the context of state socialist countries' interactions with, um, with, with, uh, with countries in the global south, oftentimes friendship and solidarity was substantively practiced, both on the level of inter interhuman relations and more, and more broadly, there was some meaning to this idea of friendship, uh, even though at the times it was a cloak to disguise unequal power relations. 
uh, whereas now we just left with the with the motion. We just left with the evil without the um, without the, the, the remnants of solidarity which have been completely undetected. Um, but in the case of the palace of culture, I mean one uh, uh, the palace of culture is no longer the tallest building in Warsaw, so Norman Foster uh, 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 raised his his head everywhere. Um, and <laughs> has designed a, a taller building than the than past culture, so it's in, uh, several hundred meters away from the from the palace. Um, and uh, and we all know that he's currently working on his plans to privatize Hakiv, um, uh, which are under um, which apparently have been signed a contract with Hakiv in his plans, but the details of it have not yet been have not yet been um, revealed to the public. But the, the, I mean, I, I gave one example of what's happening with the, with the Palace of Culture in, in this talk, uh, and actually the main thing that's happening to the area of the Palace of Culture is the, 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 the parade square surrounding the palace is the construction of the Museum of Modern Art in, in Warsaw. So, whereas for, for, for uh, several decades after the fall of communism, many uh, towers and other buildings were created in the um, sort of a radius of several hundred meters away from the palace of culture, no buildings were built in this enormous Place de Fillat Parade Square uh, surrounding, immediately surrounding the palace. Even though many attempts were made, somehow there was some kind of, people were also referred to as a curse or a complex, and this was also the title of our book, that prever prevented any um, physical incursions onto the immediate um, vicinity of the palace from happening. But now this, this complex, this curse has been broken, it seems, and the Museum of Modern Art is, is, under, is under construction. So, and and the, the, the square itself has been redesigned by, uh, by a young collective of Polish, Italian, and Japanese um, architects. So, there is some kind of transformation on the way, um, but uh, a lot of that's dependent on the, the um, machinations of, of property. The restitution of, of, of um, properties to create to the descendants of crew workers, um, etc. But the, the, the palace of culture uh, still um, retains a kind of uh, 